and the session we've got now, we're looking at film, the role of film in global health, um, but from a shining the spotlight on community's perspective. So putting the community at heart. And earlier we said community could be the protected community, or it could be indeed be the um, the, the the policy maker side. That is the kind of de on the definition of community, really. You know, either the policy side or the community side. We wanted to approach both and see what could be done. So I'm very very honoured to be joined by one of the biggest success stories in global health. I'm sure if you all follow what's happening in uh, dengue, as an example. The World Mosquito Programme, headed up by Professor Scott O'Neill, who actually sits on our Dengue Advisory Group, we're proud to say um, that we set up as part of our World Dengue Day campaign. Um, their Wolbachia well, approach, uh, the RCTs that they've come out with and the data they've come out with has been shown to be exemplar. Underlining all of that, underpinning that, is their absolute approach uh, in terms of putting the community first. And we wanted to open that up a bit because I think it's fascinating, lots of lessons to be learned. So without further ado for me, I'd like to introduce to the floor two speakers from that organization, the head of communications, Bruno Cole, and also the head of community engagement, Alan Mee, who are kindly joining us uh, for this. Uh, so I'm just going to I'm going to just going to uh, put your camera off, uh, Giles, and your microphone. There we go. But you're there in the background. That's fine. Um, and we'll bring you in shortly. So I'm just going to bring the floor over to, to Bruno. If you could put your camera on, Bruno, we, we, we can we can start your presentation. Well, listen, lo lovely to meet you all. Uh, it's a privilege uh, to be with you this morning. Uh, I'm currently based in the south of France, in Albi. Uh, recently, the World Mosquito Program did actually open a brand new office in, um, in on the <coughs> continent, and uh, we have actually decided to uh, base ourselves in the southwest of France. Um, so I'm currently based in Albi. Uh, just quickly to introduce myself, I've been actually working with the WMP program, WMP, I'm sorry, since actually uh, 2019. Uh, and before that, my background has been, uh, I was a TV producer and, a, and uh, working in the film industry uh, for many, many years. Uh, I used to produce a lot of wildlife documentaries, uh, make my way to Australia uh, pretty much 27 years ago, uh, fell in love with the country and decided to start to work in Australia. Uh, working in the film industry, starting my own business uh, as a film producer. And then in 2010, I actually joined uh, the humanitarian sector working for World Vision uh, as one of the video producer and really quickly became the communication director for World Vision Australia. Uh, in 2013, I've moved actually to uh, lead communication in Central and West Africa for World Vision International. I was actually in, uh, in Sierra Leone during the, the Ebola crisis uh, and I work over there for quite some time and I've been actually very specialized in uh, covering uh, communication uh, during the time of crisis and natural disaster. After that, I moved actually to work in Jordan, working on the Syrian crisis uh, for more than one year, uh, being based in Amman, uh, but working in Gaziantep in uh, different parts of, uh, uh, you know, uh, part of Iraq and Lebanon or so. And then after that, I moved to Vietnam to join the World Mosquito Program. Uh, for some of you, the World Mosquito Program is 100% affiliated to Monash University in Australia. Uh, and uh, we have actually offices in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, we have also uh, an office in Oceaning City, a small office in Po. And of course, we have actually uh, uh, communicators, community engagement specialists and implementation specialists in different parts of the world, like in Brazil. And I was very uh, happy to hear that one of the participants is from uh, Fire Cruz, which is a very, very uh, valuable and uh, important partner for us in Brazil. Uh, so really quickly, uh, as part of the presentation, I will actually uh, present with Alan Me, uh, and uh, we have done a small PowerPoint presentation, and uh, I might actually show you a couple of slides uh, and pretty much to talk about it, but then come back actually to uh, to talk to you and uh, to um, to um, uh, re-engage with you physically. But let me start this presentation. Um, 
So I don't know if you can. Yeah, should, should I start? Oh, you've got it. There uh, you go. Oh, this is Perfect. it. All right. So what we would like to talk to you about it today is actually a couple of things is uh, what we call community voices. Uh, community voices is uh, uh, pretty much. Uh, you know, a, a joint principle and approach from communication and community engagement. Uh, until actually one year, the two function were working actually together as part of one team. And then uh, after the arrival of Alan, we decided actually to divide those two uh, functions. However, we, we still work really, really closely together, as you can imagine. So what we would like to talk to you about today is and actually how we establish our communication strategy and principle to actually empower and partner with communities and for the overall goal to fight a, a mosquito borne disease. Uh, so a couple of things regarding communication, and I will let Alan, of course, to talk about the community engagement part of the presentation. Um, so... One of the things that is really, really important for um, WMP and, uh, you know, and as Karam mentioned before, we don't do anything without the approval of communities and the way that actually communities are involved in actually our work. And so for communication, we are pretty much exactly uh, doing exactly that. So we are aiming actually to produce a lot of content, uh, to echo the voice of a community, to make sure that community are participating, are being mobilized, uh, and also uh, to really empower our staff. Usually our staff are actually a local base, they are part of a community, and we think that it is very, very important uh, for staff and community to be able to help us to produce actually the content that we use for external engagement, uh, we use for our social media platform, we use also for advocacy and for our overall messaging. One of the things that, uh, that has been very important for me and for the organization is we're not producing our content for marketing purposes. We are pretty much creating our content to keep actually a conversation with communities totally alive. And it's a continuous actually dialogue between uh, the global communication team and the, the communities and the local staff, making sure that we really uh, create actually content that uh, represent what they do, what they experience, uh, their ambition, sometimes uh, their failures, as well as actually their success. We are trying to be as transparent as possible in the content we produce. And we share that, uh, you know, in a very transparent way also with actually our global networks. Uh, one of the things that uh, we really aim, and, and let's face it, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, the importance of storytelling uh, has been even more increasing the last couple of years. Uh, one of the things that, of course, the COVID pandemic did trigger the simple fact that it was impossible for, uh, you know, global communicators to be able to travel, uh, to report, uh, to have actually uh, media uh, traveling to our printer implementation side to be able actually to talk about the World Mosquito Program. So what we were doing, it was we very dependent on actually uh, local production companies, uh, our staff and community members. So what we do did is actually really push for um, uh, you know uh, our uh, communities to be able to produce their own content. And what we did is actually we help them to develop a more robust storytelling culture at implementation level. And so now we start actually to uh, use exactly the same uh, principle, the same approach to really uh, put storytelling in the heart of everything we do in terms of communication at a leadership level, at a global team level, at a function level, and of course, to continue this with actually communities and staff. Um, one of the, I've actually put for you on this particular slide, couple of really, uh, uh, you know, um, principles uh, that we, we love uh, to uh, work, uh, base ourselves and, and use that as a foundation to actually deliver our work on a daily basis. Uh, we borrow trust from existing supporters to engage new ones. So what we start, what we have been doing is actually uh, interview 
uh, communities in Sri Lanka and use actually this content to advocate uh, for uh, new partners, new communities in another part of the world. Uh, it did actually even happen that not a long time ago, uh, we had actually exchange between, uh, you know, community reference group and uh, and uh, local government to be able to have actually direct conversation. And I remember a meeting in Vietnam a couple of years ago where indeed you have an exchange between uh, two groups coming together and to talk about the experience with WMP. Of course, the context were different. Uh, the, the ability to deliver the WMP methodology were also different, but the ultimate goal was exactly the same. So what we really like to try to do is making sure that uh, you know we can borrow trust and we are not talking about ourselves but we have other people to talk about the world mosquito program we also empower our local teams that it's really important it's probably not new for many of you on how we can really and i remember what gabrielle was saying is how you can actually sometime uh, leverage the fact that you can have actually a small capacity in one country, but this capacity, even if they are not communicators, they can help us to champion some really, really good content. And if, of course, as you all know, with actually technology like a mobile phone, uh, you can actually create videos and good photos. And now more and more of our staff is actually are sharing uh, good content. Um, we build on the work we have done. That's something very important for me. When we define our strategy uh, three years ago, we actually stick to it. Of course, not everything was perfect and we were able to readapt our strategy. But if I have an advice actually for some of you who uh, are here to be able to listen to what I believe has been a good communication delivery from the World Mosquito Program. One of the reasons we were successful and we're still successful is because we actually stick uh, and deliver on a different approach uh, and we don't change these approaches one after year. We keep one and we keep going. And so what it does, it does it make is like people are trained, uh, capacity and skill are developed, and the content become better and better. And in this particular case, I must admit, it has been very, very important for us when we actually engage with community to have actually good content when we do a strategy, exit strategy, when we finalize actually a, a project, for example. Um, we align our brand. We are a small organization, so we make sure that our brand is pretty much uh, all across our internal and external channels. Um, it's not new. Uh, it's not actually, uh, uh, so most of you will understand that. And I'm sure across your organization, across your uh, uh, your uh, communication, you do that yourself. So we really want to make sure that our brand is actually very strong. We even have actually created what we call a campaign in a box. So it's meant for some countries where the capacity in terms of mass communication, creative ability to have local resources. What we do is we have created a, what we call a campaign in a box. So all the elements actually from a mass communication campaign are given to our local partners and uh, they can adapt that the way they want in terms of a translation, of course, but in terms of actually on the way they use it. What we saw with actually the implementation of a company in a box is actually a more aligned visibility of our brand across the board. And you will probably see if you look and explore our digital platform, a lot of photos where people are doing the a W sign, and uh, that is actually the global campaign. We welcome Wolbachia. Uh, and then one of the things that I'm very proud in terms of working for the double, uh, World Mosquito Program is making sure that we have a very strong learning knowledge platform. Uh, I've worked with very big NGOs, uh, you know, um, working with World Vision International, it's, if I'm correct, it's around 30,000 people. However, I felt that the learning knowledge platform of the WMP 
is actually much stronger, very, very strong. Uh, staff are able actually to develop skills, uh, you know, remotely. Uh, we actually describe all the different practice. We have actually learning modules uh, in order to actually deliver good communication, uh, good advocacy. Uh, we talk on how we can actually create a video. Uh, so how, um, you know, uh, learning practice are very, very strong. And I do believe it's towards the advantage of our local teams and also local communities. Uh, so this is it for me at this stage. I'm going to bring back the slide for Alan to talk about community engagement. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you, Bruno. Um, so uh, first of all, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Alan May. I'm Director of Community Engagement for World Mosquito Program. I'm based in the west of Ireland and have been with uh, World Mosquito Program for two years. My background is in stake stakeholder and community engagement across the energy and renewable sector, working in Asia, Africa, and the Americas. So in the last two years, I'm learning about the public health and uh, NTD space, and I'm still very much in learning mode. Um, but I wanted to take a few moments to talk about our approach to community engagement. So. In World Mosquito Program, listening to and incorporating community voices is driven by our public acceptance model. And that model uh, we call PAM is underpinned by guiding principles and also commitments we make to the community. So first of all, I just wanna talk a little bit about our guiding principles. Uh, you know, these principles are not, are not surprising to anyone, but um, it's very important that saying what we do and doing what we say in the community is, is something we do because that's how you build trust. It's how you build trust with communities. And our PAM principles guide how we act day to day, week to week, and throughout the projects. So first of all, we're responsive. You know, we listen to and respond to requests, queries, and concerns. And listening is a very important source of input into the design of the project. So it's important to listen early not just to listen when you're delivering a project, but to listen early at the design stage so you can change design. It's a very important source of learning to listen. Um, we're respectful. You know, we care for the community, its people, their interests and needs. So this means um, we also want to respect their cultural heritage, both tangible and intangible. And in practice, what this means is that we avoid certain sensitive locations when we come to do mosquito releases, or we uh, avoid certain sensitive times around particular local events, particular festivals, and particular feast days. And again, you need to develop an understanding of the community to know where you need to be sensitive and respectful. We are transparent, we're clear, open and honest um, in our communications and transparency also is about leaning into those uncomfortable conversations, not, not backing away, but actually leaning in, listening, understanding and accepting. We are inclusive, uh, we work with everyone uh, to include, we include everyone and seek diverse inputs because we know our vision of a world free from the fear and suffering of mosquito-borne diseases can only be achieved when we integrate those gender equality, disability, and social inclusion considerations into our engagement approach. So those are the guiding principles. And again, principles are something that you have to take down each day and look at. They're not something that are just on a shelf gathering dust. So in terms of the commitments we make to the community, our commitments actually drive the activity set we deliver. So we build an understanding, as I've mentioned, of the community and incorporate their needs into the project. So you have to do that early. If you don't get understanding early, then it's too late. Projects are designed. So we respect the community's right to be informed about the project, and we build that into our communications and community engagement approaches. And that's informed about the benefits of the project, but also about the risks and being honest about that. We respect and reflect the diversity of the community in our engagement process. We also avoid or minimize the negative social impacts of our activities. And of course, to do that, you have to identify the social impacts. So again, that's an activity that takes place early on. We assure that uh, queries and complaints are addressed. That's very much what we would call access to remedy, very important principle in, in human rights. Um, we involve and empower the community to participate in our projects. So it's going beyond informing and consulting. It's about involvement and empowerment.
And as Bruno had mentioned, we assess the level of community acceptance and we only start releases with community support. So these are the commitments that drive our activities day to day. But let's look in a little more detail at the public acceptance model. In the public acceptance model, we have flexibility to use a variety of methods depending on the local project's needs, but overall the same process is, is, is followed. But I would say it's, it's important to have that flexibility. This is not something that can be like a cookie cutter that is just a standard formula you apply. You have to give flexibility to local teams and that's what we do. So the first stage is very much about building that understanding I mentioned. We want to know the impacts in the community of these deadly diseases and that understanding can help drive our project design and also the design of our communications and engagement campaigns. So to get that understanding, we develop a community profile and the community profile is not just a dry document of demographic data. It's a document which we build uh, based on knowledge of the community and understanding we've gained and then actually we articulate actionable insights that come back into the organization so we can take some action. We conduct baseline surveys so we know about what the level of awareness and acceptance is. And in those baseline surveys, we also understand what are the preferred methods for communication that communities have. And we implement our incident management system early. You know, we don't leave it till we start uh, releasing mosquitoes to get feedback or complaints. We actually do it much earlier so that people can actually make a um, complaint or ask a query uh, at the very early stages of projects. The second thing we do is we create awareness. Um, creating awareness of us and our methods ensures that the community has the information they need so that their questions can be answered, their concerns can be addressed, and then actually they can make informed decisions, informed decisions about whether they want to accept the project or not. So um, we create awareness through our communications campaigns and, and Bruno has described how they are very much on the ground and very much involve a storytelling component. We conduct stakeholder engagements, making sure that there are inclusive engagements across, across a broad number of people in the areas where we're doing the releases. And we also have very tangible events, launch and demonstration events, so people can touch and feel and see what it is we're going to be done, doing. So that's creating awareness. Um, involving communities, so we want to move beyond just the informing or consulting with the community. We want to involve um, and empower them. And the community reference group uh, is a way that that is achieved. So it's a small group of people who are broadly in, uh, who are diverse and representative of the community and we um, we seek their advice and their endorsement on our activities. So the community reference group is one way people get involved. Another way that residents in the neighborhood get involved is to host a mosquito release container or a BG trap during our monitoring phases. And a project we actually did recently in Sri Lanka, well, maybe going back a, back a few months, actually, back six or seven months ago, um, was a crowdsourcing of our design for the mosquito release containers. So again, we're involving people in designing some of what it is will be part of the project. And gaining acceptance. I think this is a critical thing for, for us in, in World Mosquito Pro, uh, Program. Um, we... Before we release any mosquitoes, we determine if the community has granted acceptance through a variety of indicators. And a key one of those is an independently conducted survey, uh, the pre-release survey. Uh, we also seek the endorsement of the community reference group. And we look to see, have we resolved any, uh, uh, any issues that have arisen? And also what the level of opposition is. So acceptance is, uh, is a very tricky concept, really. Um, and just the concept of community acceptance, both of those are tricky. Who is the community? What is the community? What does acceptance mean? I mean, in some respects, acceptance is indeterminate. It's contingent. And of course, it's reversible. So just because you have it at one time, it doesn't mean it, it exists forever. But one of the things we do is these indicators are really a due diligence test. Have we done everything we could have done to make uh, create awareness to involve people and then to gain acceptance so this is uh, this is my final slide um, acceptance as I as I just said is, is measured through a range of indicators but here are the acceptance levels from across the globe as measured measured by those independently conducted surveys and again the, the survey is just one of the indicators but I, I just thought I would show you so what we find actually is that it, it's very high across across the globe and there's not a whole lot of variation really it, it's 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 pretty high and 
furthermore, we measure the acceptance and also the awareness, and we find that the acceptance levels are high even when awareness levels are not as high. And so we're examining that topic at the moment, actually, because it's very interesting. Why are people very accepting of our project when maybe they're not aware of all of the detail? Well, we think partly it's because the community engagement approach we have develops a high level of trust. There's trust in our competency, there's trust in who we are, there's trust in our people on the ground. And so people accept the method without full awareness of the detail. But that's something we have to look a little bit um, a little bit more closely at. So look, that's a quick overview of how we listen to the community voices and meaningfully incorporate them into the project. Uh, so um, on behalf of myself and Bruno, just thanks for your time and there's a Q&A session later. Thank you very, very much indeed, both Bruno and Alan. Absolutely amazing. And we knew that it would be amazing um, simply because of the success story that is WMP and to hear how you know, how you really thought about putting this uh, community uh, engagement at the heart of everything. Uh, some huge points raised, which I'm definitely sure they're going to come into the Q&A, this bit borrowing of trust and this building uh, of the community of practice and how that impacts these acceptance rates as an example and the overall success. Lots of food for thought. And as I said earlier, lots of lessons that are transferable in different uh, disease settings as well. So I'm sure you'd have a lot of questions coming through. Thank you both very, very much for that. Um, just a quick shout out. We've been joined by uh, Dr. Aribador saying, same great presentation. Um, also, Dr. Adepojo and Dr. Orabwaze Okonkwo from Nigeria, Dr. Lauren Carruthers from the University of Glasgow, um, who's going to be joining us back. She's had to pop out. Um, I would say to everybody, please don't be shy. There's loads of attendees here. Just give your names and your country. We're going to give you a shout out and have your questions ready. Just type them into the chat and we'll weave them through and we'll give you a um, a kind of a, a shout out as well. These sessions are for you. And it, you, both Alan and Bruno mentioned a community of practice. This is a community of learning, as it were, learning from each other. So, you know, again, thanks a lot for the WMP um, thought and effort behind that presentation. Thank you very much for that. Very well received, I'm sure. Um, that moves us to the next um, uh, speaker for the session. Um, we mentioned earlier uh, communities, we focused really on the affected communities there for a bit, but also another area of change that is a definition of a community itself is the policyholder, policy maker uh, himself or herself. And that strata really um, is something that the Medicines for Malaria Venture, our next speaker organization, wanted to speak about. They've had a really uh, interesting um, trial out in place in the Brazilian Amazon with single dose tafenoquine and a point of care uh, G6 PD test from in malaria settings, trying to get that into the national health system for Brazil. And I think they're waiting for a policy decision, um, fingers crossed, uh, in April of this year, so the following month, in next month. But using film to approach this, uh, I think we're very, very honored and uh, delighted uh, we spoke with Elizabeth Paul, the Director of Communications, Katie Athersuch, uh, and other uh, colleagues, and they put forward uh, Elodie Jamba, the Senior Director of Access and Product Development, uh, Product Management at the Medicines for Malaria Ventures, um, and speaking about from science to real life, tackling relapsing malaria in the Amazon. And just to say that both WMP put forward four films and their place, I think we put a link out earlier to the showcase in the chat. So when you do have a chance, that's going to be there for forever uh, moving forward. Um, fe feel free to dip into some amazing uh, submissions uh, um, and entries into that particular showcase. Um, and certainly the MMV have put two films forward, one for malaria and one for uh, the pregnant uh, pregnancy cohort, pregnant women's cohort in terms of the African uh, study that they're doing, uh, approach uh, they're doing for their malaria uh, candidates and the clinical trials of that. But I think enough from me, I think we'd like to pass the floor over to Elodie. Um, Elodie Jambert, if you're there, I'll just say a quick bonjour and uh, and put your camera on and your the floor is, it, it's, it's yours. Yeah. Thank you so much, Cameron. 
Thank you so much, uh, everyone, and really excited to be here today with all of you. Um, just maybe a quick word of introduction. Uh, first of all, so my name is Elodie Jambert, and I'm a senior director at Medicine for Mary Adventure, working in the access and product management team. So my background is um, I'm a pharmacist by training, and I've been working with, um, first of all, the World Health Organization for a couple of years, and then uh, quickly went into the field. So I've been working on polio eradication in a couple of uh, countries and then moved to uh, Doctors Without Borders for about 12 years, um, working in uh, different places, mostly China and India, really on HIV, AIDS, TB, uh, Maria, and uh, and a lot on access issues, really, you know, uh, has been very uh, important for me to make sure that, you know, all the patients can have access to affordable uh, medicine that are being developed. And then since uh, about six years now, I've been moving to MMV, the, which stands for Medicine for Mara Venture, um, which is a non-for-profit organization which is based in Geneva and which is um, basically designing, developing and delivering a new anti-marial medicine. So since its uh, creation about a bit more than 20 years ago now, MMV has been developing about uh, 15 medicine. Um, antimarial medicine and uh, treating more than um, 3 million patients. So I'm really proud to be part of that team and really part of uh, being the um, working within the access team because that's really, as I said, um, really uh, part of my DNA, I would say, uh, with my MSF background. Um, so today we are really extremely pleased, um, delighted and proud actually to show you a wonderful uh, video that was um, done in Brazil in the Amazon region and um, and really to show how uh, we could introduce a new drug that was uh, that has been co-developed by both MMV and uh, GSK a few years back and how can we uh, how is it possible uh, to to implement that within the Brazilian uh, health system health system so we will be showing a, a movie. I think um, the movie will then uh, come afterwards. Uh, I'm happy to give maybe a couple of slides of introduction before uh, the movie is being shown, just to set up a little bit the scene. And, um, and just to start by saying that um, this work that I'm going to talk about was really um, done in Brazil uh, with the National Marriage Control Program. And uh, as you might know, um, Brazil is home to 90% um, of viva cases. And just to uh, give a little bit of background for everyone uh, who may not have that, uh, uh, who are not familiar with Maria, basically you have uh, five different species um, uh, for, for Maria. And Vivax is uh, one of them. Uh, Faciparum is the most predominant one and that is mostly found in, uh, in Africa and Vivax is mostly predominant in Latin America and the Southeast uh, Asia region. And as you can see here in Brazil, 90% of the cases are Vivax. So this is really very important for the um, national uh, program to tackle Vivax in order to, um, to achieve their Maria elimination goal. And uh, what is quite particular about Brazil is that 99% of the cases are in that Amazon region. And so this is where we have been uh, concentrating all the effort and working hand in hand with the Minister of Health to make that happen. And Brazil have, uh, has an extremely good uh, public health system. Um, all the patients who are coming to the clinics are being tested for malaria and uh, all of them are treated and tested and treated for free within the public health system. And they have, therefore, they have a very good access um, to, to um, case management at all the different levels of the healthcare system, at the hospital level, in smaller health facilities, but also, and quite importantly, um, also uh, with health healthcare agents who are basically the one who are reaching um, to the most remote population. So they do that by uh, going on boat, on motorcycles, and they are the one really who test and treat most of the patient, as you will see in the video. So these are, are really the core of the public health system. Those, those agents are really the one who, who deliver um, those antimarial medicines to the patient who need it most. Um, and what is quite particular about Vivax um, is that uh, Opposite to Faciparum, for example, is that the parasite uh, does not only goes into the blood 
um, but also goes into the liver. And therefore, this is why you need two different treatments for all the patients who are being tested positive for Vivax Maria. You need one treatment to treat the blood stage. And in most countries, it's a drug called chloroquine. And you need another drug um, to uh, treat the parasites that goes dormant in the liver and can sort of relapse uh, from time to time at a later stage after the infection. And so, so far, the current standard of care, which is being used in many countries, is a drug called Primaquine. Uh, however, the main disadvantage, I would say, of Primaquine is that it has to be taken over 7 to 14 days. Uh, and that's a, a, a major um, challenges, let's say, for many Ministry of Health, because most patients are not really compliant, uh, do not really adhere to the 7 or 14 days uh, treatment of, of Primaquine. Uh, and currently, um, the, 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 there is no use of a, a point of care G6PD testing. And the G6PD test is, uh, is necessary in order to provide either Primaquine or this new drug that we have been developing it and that I'm going to talk about uh, more in a, in a few minutes um, to make sure that patients have enough enzymatic activity of this specific enzyme in order to be able to take safely either Primaquine or Tafenoquine. So, so far in Brazil, uh, just to summarize uh, that in few words, um, they are using uh, chloroquine with Primaquine and without G6PD testing. And that's going to be important, as you will see uh, in a minute, uh, for, for that new drug uh, that we are bringing on board. Um, and MERA treatment is really not available in private sector and pharmacies. Everything is being provided through the public health system in Brazil, which is called SUS. So this is uh, the, the aim of that study um, was really, I mean, first of all, we, we have been interacting a lot with the uh, Minister of Health of Brazil uh, since, I would say, uh, six years. So while Tafanoquin uh, was still under development, we started engaging with the Minister of Health. Um, in Brazil, and Brazil has been participating in this uh, phase three uh, clinical trial uh, that led to uh, the approval of tafenoquine. So they knew the medicine. They were very interested about the medicine. Uh, they have been part of the research and they were keen to see how is it feasible to implement both the g 6 p test and tafenoquine within the public health system. And so this was really the aim, uh, the core um, objective of, of that study, uh, which was an operational research to look at uh, ways and, and how to overcome uh, challenges, potential challenges and concerns related to the introduction of those new tools uh, in Brazil at the different level of the HESCA system. Um, and so, as you can see, the, the, the main focus was really to assess whether the healthcare workers and including those um, uh, healthcare, uh, healthcare workers that uh, we've been talking about um, uh, in the last few hours is, is really how feasible was it, is it for them to implement uh, that, um, uh, you know, within the most remote places. And so um, the idea was really to, once the patient has been tested for uh, positive for Vavax Maria, it was to see how can we test a patient with using this point of care G6PD test that you can see on this slide. And then based on the result of that test um, to either provide the current standard of care, which is made of chloroquine with primaquine for seven days, or use a three-day treatment uh, with chloroquine and a single dose of tafenoquine. And obviously the, the, the main advantage of tafenoquine is to be um, taken in a single dose. So it's two pills that you take at once. And that obviously then um, uh, facilitates you know, adherence from, from patient as compared to the seven days primaquine. Uh, so Brazil is really the first country in the world that has been looking at uh, at this to, to implement um, Tafenoquine in uh, real life, basically. So that study was done in two different municipalities, Manaus and Porto Velho, which are both in the Amazon region. Uh, and as you can see, that was done at quite a large, large scale. So it was done in 49 health facilities in those two different municipalities. And um, in, nine high, in nine higher and medium uh, level facilities, and most importantly, in 40 lower level facilities. So really uh, looking again at the feasibility of introducing those in, in a wide uh, variety of, of different uh, healthcare um, facilities. Um, 
And that was really very much implemented with the Ministry of Health. So that was done through the routine health system. And the Brazilian Ministry of Health, uh, who was the, the sponsor of that study, was really the one implementing everything. So doing the um, updating the treatment guideline, doing the training, um, uh, providing the, 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 the product, you know, being in charge of treating, testing and treating the patient, doing the surveillance and the management of adverse events. And the trust team was uh, much more here as um, started support and also to help analyze the, the data at the end. So the key finding, and that's going to be my, my last slide, the key finding of that uh, study was, first of all, it is the first and largest experience using tafenoquine and g 6 tests. So tafenoquine was used in more than 2,600 patients uh, in Brazil for the radical cure, and that was implemented by the Ministry of Health um, by all the different community health agents through their routine care system. So the training was also conducted by the municipal health staff with support from clinicians and using a set of standardized materials that have been developed, um, including competency assessment to make sure that you know, the, the, the training was, was well understood. And so overall, um, uh, an amazing result, amazing, um, amazing to see that actually tafenoquine uh, was correctly used in more than 99% of the cases based on the G6PD activity. So basically all the patients who received tafenoquine received that in a correct manner and there was no mistake done by the healthcare workers um, on the use of tafenkin. Um, and just a last slide to say thank you to all the ones that have been involved in, in that study. As you can see, uh, there are a, a wide range of uh, stakeholders uh, that were involved in the study. Um, and with that, maybe I will um, go back to you, Cameron, to see how can we project the movie and happy to take any question at the end. Brilliant. Thank you very, very much for that, Elodie. A very robust look at a different type of community, but again, engagement along the lines of uh, trust building um, and, and this community approach in terms of bringing them on, engaging, and then, then, then reflective in the actual results that you're seeing. And fingers crossed for your April, um, the, the yes. news in April, fingers genuinely crossed. I think there's a fantastic approach to show uh, how, how that can be. So, all of that distilled into the film. Um, I said earlier, we've put it up on the showcase as well for anyone in their own time to see and we'll be tweeting out from that. But for this for this session, we've got it uploaded as well. So with your permission, Elodie, I'm going to press start. Yeah, sure, please do. And here we go, everybody. I think it's eight minutes in length, but this is the film approach to unlocking that community and uh, moving forward. So here we go. Three, two, one. There we go. <laughs> Essa doença eu acho uma doença muito agressiva e covarde, né? Ela atinge a maioria da nossa população pobre, carente, que não tem uma educação de qualidade, né? E tudo isso complica o nosso lado de passar a informação para eles. A malária, pelo que a gente tem experiência aí de ver, ela destrói a família de primeira. Porque às vezes se o pai, se ele estiver doente de malária e não estiver sendo tratado, aí não tem o peixe, não tem o trabalho, não tem a farinha, e aí começa a decadência da família. The most of the times fever is the major symptom of malaria. So whenever you come from an endemic area and you have fever, you got to be submitted to a thick blood smear, which is a very simple way of diagnosis of malaria through a fingerprint. A região endêmica da malária no Brasil é a Amazônia, onde cerca de 99% dos casos acontecem. A região amazônica tem essa característica onde as pessoas não estão concentradas em grandes áreas. É uma área enorme com grande distribuição uh, espacial. In South America, a malaria does not kill as much as it kills in Africa. However, children are not going to school, they have cognitive problems, so they're not learning as much as the others. And the workers, they don't go to work, they lose their jobs. So there is a high social impact around this febrile disease.
The problem with Vavax malaria is that in addition to the acute infection, the parasites can also stay dormant in the liver and awaken at a later stage. And this is called relapse. And therefore for the patient, it's not only important to treat the blood stage infection, but also the liver stage infection. Otherwise the parasites will awaken again and again, creating new episodes of malaria and the patient will feel sick every time. No Brasil, a gente tem um tratamento com cloroquina e primaquina. A cloroquina faz o tratamento da forma sanguínea, onde os glóbulos vermelhos são infectados. A primaquina faz o tratamento da forma que fica no fígado, os chamados hipnozoítos. A gente fala da importância do medicamento, de não quebrar o tratamento, tomar direitinho. É um trabalho que a gente não baixa, não é? é todo o tempo em cima das pessoas ali, tentando explicar e dizer que o tratamento tem que ser feito, tem que ser feito, porque não tínhamos uma droga diferente. Hoje já temos alguma coisa que pintou aí, né? que é a tafenoquina. Brazil is a great place to the study of Vivex because it's most of the cases related to Pivivex. And that was helped by the fact that we have an institution that over the last decades has been contributing to the performance of clinical trials. A implementação da, da tafenoquina, ela chegou para o estado do Amazonas como uma, uma importante ferramenta inovadora que ela vem para nos trazer a esperança, a expectativa de que malária é possível eliminar. There are two main issues with the liver stage treatment. The first one is that with the current standard of care, called Primaquin, we know that most patients do not really follow the full course of the treatment. The second issue with the liver stage treatment is that they can cause hemolysis in patients who have a severe deficiency in a specific enzyme called glucose cis-phosphate dehydrogenase, or G6PD. So G6PD deficiency is a very common type of genetic deficiency around the world. Uh, here in Brazil, we assume that 5% of the population are deficient for G6PD. So when they are deficient for that enzyme, they have regular lives, but when they use primaquine or tifenoquine, that might trigger severe anemia. Therefore, it is really important before prescribing any of those liver stage treatments for every patient to be tested in order to assess the level of enzyme that they have and provide the adequate treatment. Tofenoquine is a variant of primaquine with the benefit that it lasts more time in the blood with a single administration. So for neglected population, it's very useful that you don't have to use for 14 or 7 days primaquine to tackle the problem of relapses, but you can, in a supervised way, give tofenoquine to that specific population and they will be cured against the relapse. Tudo que é novo assusta, né? Então, no início, ah, não vai, não vai dar certo porque as pessoas não vão querer fazer o teste, então vou esquecer de fazer o teste de G6PD para iniciar o tratamento da tafenoquina. E hoje a gente observa que isso caiu na rotina. Já sabe que para se tomar a tafenoquina precisa fazer primeiramente o teste de G6PD. Now there is this implementation that you see that the health agents themselves are involved in the process. It makes it faster to take something which a couple of years ago was in the field of science to real life now. The major benefit of a single dose treatment is to reach those populations which are remotely located because those are the ones which do not have a proper access to the health system. 
Therefore, the fact that they have the access now to a single dose drug and also the access to the 6 pd deficiency test makes their life much better. Okay, so as that just comes on, I'll just press refresh. Okay, so absolutely amazing, Elodie. <laughs> amazing video to bring all of that, your research and all of the success metrics you'd mentioned before and this approach uh, to life. Um, some interesting uh, questions have come through on that already um and so you know a big shout out obviously to yourself but you had a huge list of stakeholders there as well um and to, to elizabeth paul for, to, to over, for overseeing that katie as as such was mentioned as well fantastic effort a lot of uh, people in the audience are, are commenting on that as well um i would say to that and to, in terms of the audience please do we've had some questions coming through in terms of consent and acceptance rates um, measurement of consent and, and uh, acceptance rates for the previous uh, presentation also applicable uh, here as well these sessions are meant for you so please don't be shy please do go ahead and put your questions into that chat box and we will be answering uh, asking those questions that brings me to the last speaker in the session um, we're going back to Jaya Agile's Rebu from the WHO. Um, and Gilles, I think you don't have a presentation, but I think we're going to, because of timing, we're going to give you about five minutes uh, to just give a quick kind of brief overview of what you're doing um, and uh, just a quick kind of, uh, you know, interplay there. And then we'll move to the Q&A. So we'll give you about five minutes because of the timings. We're going to condense that down. I believe there's no slides, but I'll hand the floor over to you. Thank you, Elodie, uh, as well, again. Right, over to you, Gilles. Over to you. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, indeed. I, I will try to be short. Let me take, check the timing now. So I do, so 11.30. So I have to, to be fast. Okay. Uh, yeah, I wanted to, to go back on practical elements that we mentioned, but to be practical on, on elements we mentioned at the beginning and uh, echo a little bit what was said by the two of the speakers, the three of the speakers before me. Uh, so when you, we spoke with Gabi at the start, uh, you asked about mentoring and, uh, and also about um, how the communication uh, for entities, uh, especially my experiences with filmmaking. So, so how filmmaking could be uh, useful and, and better done or, or improved, uh, especially with communities. So, to me, first of all, I would like to say that communication should be part of public health policies. It should be a component of the, of, of the strategy for public health improvements. Uh, we have seen that in, in the experience we have had with COVID, with so many misinformation and disinformation and fake news and so on. So, of course, maybe we don't have the same challenge to face with NTDs, but my experience in filming uh, for during one month on Bourouli Ulcer in four countries have um, showed me that for some uh, neglected diseases uh, in remote areas where it's not there because it's neglected there's less not enough information the local communities are often faced with uh, also misinformation or um, lack of information and I think audiovisual tools especially as we said 
through um, the smartphone, the, the access they have on smartphone now in every location, even remote, uh, these audiovisual tools and maybe some interactive applications on smartphone as well could, could really help fighting the misinformation. And when I was filming on Burulser in Togo, uh, I went in Ghana, Togo, Benin, and Cameroon for that. Um, for instance, I met a doctor there in Togo, and he told me there's so much uh, challenge to face with the traditional healers uh, because there are a lot of uh, beliefs around witchcraft. And and on Burulser, it was not known what what is the cause of this disease. So. Uh, instead of fighting the, the, the traditional healers and the witchcraft beliefs, this doctor told me, I have, a, I have negotiated a deal with uh, traditional healers and I, they take in charge the spiritual aspect of the disease and they agree that I should take in charge the physical aspect of the disease. So a kind of sharing of, <laughs> and when he said sp spiritual aspects, it could be linked to to psychological and mental health issues also, as we can guess. But, so I think it's interesting, you know, in, in a filming with a community, and I, I covered that, I, I made sure to cover this in depth with the community when I was there. So I managed to film a traditional healer, to interview him. Uh, I, I discovered that there was a training organized by the hospital for traditional healers to be able to identify the disease and to tell to the patient because the patient are going first to the traditional healer. So they were the first one, <laughs> the first caregivers in that case. And they were able to identify the disease and to say, well, I guess this could be Borrelial Sir. Maybe you should go to the hospital uh, as well and, and you can continue with me. So this kind of training was done in, in the field. And I think that's interesting because uh, that's the parallel I wanted to do uh, with uh, some global, some diseases which are at a global level, uh, although NTDs are sometimes only in a few areas, in a, in a few countries. Um, the two points I wanted to highlight in my intervention after this intro was about the importance of storytelling and the importance of marketing of the stories. So, um, storytelling. Uh, first, I think, well, in the WHO, of course, we always promote the, the voices of the experts, the WHO experts, and whether it's at a global level or a national level uh, and regional as well, since we have region, uh, con regional offices. But I think it's important, and we do that with the Health for All Film Festival, and we do that more and more in our uh, own production uh, going in the field. It's important to have the voices of communities balancing the voices of the experts. And, um, and of course, when I say the experts, we could include into that uh, the researchers, uh, but also the health workers, uh, which are trusted uh, in many circumstances. Um, and, and to have the voices of people in the communities, like uh, it could be the teacher at the school, or it could be uh, the community health worker in the local health center. Uh, it could be uh, the, the chief of a village or the chief of a neighborhood in a city and so on. And when I was filming for this Bull Ulcer, I'm taking this example, I did that in, in many countries in my, uh, in my uh, career. But on this example on Bull Ulcer, um, my first point with the Dobecho colleagues uh, uh, planning the filming mission, I was telling them, I need time. Filming requires a lot of time. If we want to do a good filming in the field, and I would say it's not filming about the community, it should be filming with the community. And uh, in the examples that Bruno and Alan mentioned about their activities to train the communities on how of producing themselves the, the films, I think it could be filming by the community about its own um, life and experience. So whether that's an external filmmaker, and when I say external, not necessarily international guy like me, but it could be a local crew, but the local crew coming from the capital city, they are like foreigners in a village, and they also have to, to take time to, to meet the local leaders, to choose the, the strong characters in the community, but they, and to take time to explain to them why the filming is done and what could be the purpose of the content and so on. And then, 
after choosing the strong characters, whether from the leaders of some patients, uh, local uh, or, or lo local nurse and so on, then having enough time to, to film them in different situations in their life, but also fighting the disease, uh, uh, how they understand the treatment, is it accessible, and, and all these this points. There are so many points to, to explain. Then that's about the filming mission, and, um, and, and to have all the good elements for telling the story. After that starts the post-production, as we call it in, in uh, TV production. So having the, the time also to edit different formats, as we said during the introduction, when you asked the question about TikTok and so on, I said, we need different formats. Some, some for social media, some very short clips are needed. But uh, if we want to explain all the parameters of a neglected tropical disease, which is uh, not even not known by the community itself, sometimes they don't know, like Borrelia Bur ulcer, they didn't know in at that time that it was transmitted by a bacteria, that this bacteria was, uh, was in the environment and they could catch the bacteria when going at the, at the water point and so on. So all this needs time to be explained. So sometimes we need films which are longer than the social media format. Uh, and on YouTube, we can really play videos which are, which could be a few minutes, even 10 minutes, why not 15 minutes? It depends how it's going to be, to be used. And I, to me, the storytelling, it's about managing the time, having a catchy introduction, making sure very, very, the characters are well-defined and, and, and there's uh, some emotions. Uh, also making sure we have the local uh, sounds. Uh, the reality of a film is really based on, on the audio track as well. And if we put a music throughout the film, sometimes it's becoming boring and, and we are far from the, the situation because of this music all the time there. So I'm really in favor of having good local uh, synchronized sounds on the films. And of course, music is, is useful from time to time. But all these storytelling tools for audiovisual elements are important. And I have to be fast, so I'm going to switch. Uh, so yes, a strong human touch. And we need the key facts, of course. We need some evidence uh, for the ritual. It's quite important that some key facts would be mentioned in the film. And that's where the expert, whether a doctor or a researcher, would be part of a film or of a story as well. And then, because of this editing of different formats, the marketing of the stories can be done on different platforms. And I want to insist on one thing here, and, and all the people in this room, I think, are, are quite uh, concerned by that. I think it's important to create synergy be between all the network, the, all the NGOs, public institutions, ministries, and so on, all, all the people involved to, to fight against the disease, to be together, to join, and and when there is a good story by one per by one entity, to this story to be shared by as much as we can, because we know that uh, uh, Google robots and different um, uh, on the internet, uh, all the robots are are checking how much time a story is shared, and the more the story is shared, the more the robots will put it forward in in the results when you do a research on bull ulcer or. Chagas disease or whichever schistosomiasis or whichever disease. So if we want, when people are doing a search uh, on Google, we want them to find the good stories. We, the producers of these stories, we, we have a, a good advantage to share between ourselves all what we produce. And that's the spirit of the Help for All Film Festival organized by the WHO is to, to invite all the people to submit their films. And then we try to promote as much as we can uh, the usage of film for health education, for health promotion. And we have a LinkedIn group. Uh, this is called the Health for All Film Festival uh, Advocates Groups, a group, sorry. And um, uh, you, I, I sent to Carmen the, the link to this group, but we can share it later on. Um, so if you want to join this group and, and give your experience, speak about the stories you have filmed, uh, that could be a place where we could develop more of this network of exchange. So the marketing of stories is based on this embedding by different organizations on the good stories. I think another important point for marketing is the language. 
we need to produce the stories in the local languages where the diseases are happening if we want the communities to to understand uh, to use the film so local languages production is important but of course vernacular language like uh, having films on in spanish for latin america about, about chagas having films um, in french for uh, francophone africa about uh, the diseases happening in this area and so on um i think that's uh a wonderful and i think i have to finish here <laughs> yeah sorry Jules. i just thought i'd come in there yeah. i think that's a, that a brilliant um kind of uh delving into uh, into some of these production issues and i wish we had more time to kind of open that maybe in the future we can open up a connect session and explore that um some huge feedback i'm going to ask all the panelists to come back we're supposed to finish at 11 but we can probably go if everybody's okay five minutes over to so give us about 25 minutes or so for some questions because there are some questions from the audience if everybody's okay with that um the audience are very, very happy in terms of uh, and some great feedback from the audience in terms of, uh, so Aftabuddin as an example, thanks very much. Absolutely amazing presentations, pertinent and useful information, discussion throughout the session. Echoed by, by a few uh, people, Miriam Kishinro, excellent in terms of the film, concise and to the message, to the point. Um, pretty much standard feedback from everybody. I know that Dr. Balugan um, had put forward his email for potential collaborations um, for the, with the MMV um, and wider collaborations. And what I wanted to say was this particular Q&A, <clears throat> and indeed uh, one of the threads throughout the two days is really about enhancing partnership and potential collaboration. So don't be shy in terms of the questions. It's there for you as well to get involved. So please put them through. Our question, and what I'm, what I'm going to do is to try and um, bring, I had a question, because of the time I'm gonna condense it and bring in two questions into that question. So wonderful point Bruno and Alan raised, and I love this phrase, borrowing trust, right? I absolutely love that. It's not something that I, I we always talk about trust and building trust, but I never ever heard borrowing trust. And that really reflected in the well, reflects in the success story that that you that you that you have there. Um, we've had two, what I want to do is combine that. There's two questions. One from Paula Plaza, who's the head of communications for the Unlimited Healthcare. It's the new uh, form of the Schistosomiasis Control Initiative, uh, the the foundation, the SCIF. Uh, they're called Unlimited Healthcare. They've got a session later on as well. But she had a question in terms of consent. And then um, I believe Dr. Jean Barsena from the uh, Social Innovations Organization in the Philippines had a question in terms of um, measuring acceptance rates. So what I wanted to do is combine those two questions and put these to all, put this question to all of you. Um, how does borrowing trust, how has that impacted firstly or formed how you measure consent right and the second part of that how is it accept how is it impacted acceptance rates or the success metrics in LED's case i'm just going to put that to bruno and to alan first if that's okay yeah um Listen, I, I might leave Alan to talk about borrowing trust from a uh, community engagement perspective. But from a communication, I, I, I think, um, you know, um, what was important, and I think I, I really subscribe to what Jill was talking about a little bit before, it's pretty much actually allowing the community to share their own stories, but also for them to actually deliver their own messages. Uh, and that is it. This is it. Borrowing trust is actually not something that uh, is, um, you know, uh, designed from global perspective. It is pretty much for us based on the, on the what actually community is telling us. Uh, and for us to be able to share that with another community that is received to work with WMP to implement World Backup. I need to tell you, actually, it's very simple. A perfect example of borrowing trust uh, was uh, in uh, July 2019. We sent um, 
uh, at, the, at the time, I was just starting with WMP, so I didn't have too much experience in, uh, you know, uh, looking at actually local uh, film production in, in Fiji. So what we did is actually we did the simplest uh, thing is to send a cameraman from Australia to do some content gathering in Fiji. But what did actually happen at uh, one particular moment of an interview was actually the... Uh, the leader of a community said to us, uh, releasing Wolbachia mosquitoes was like releasing hope. Yeah. And releasing hope became, and when I saw those footage for the first time, I said, this is it. I mean, as the new communication director for WMP, this is it. It is my tagline. This is the tagline for the organization. And it has been releasing hope the tagline for four years for our organization. And it's not something that we actually define from a, a marketing survey, marketing analytics or whatever. It was actually a community leader in a, a small community in Fiji who actually told us that. And so we borrow, we borrow this feeling, we borrow this trust he had into our methodology uh, to be able actually to communicate that around the world. But again, you have a lot of exchange and we are going to increase this exchange from community to community uh, in the next couple of months. That's a fantastic answer, releasing hope. Uh, that's a very powerful statement indeed, Bruno. We love that. Alan, from that to that's a communications perspective on, on this huge kind of question, right? What's your perspective yeah. from the community's perspective? Engagement. So... Yeah, look, these are the, the, the uh, so just to come to the questions on consent, acceptance. So these are complicated questions. I'm currently exploring actually in depth some of these questions with uh, Professor Jim Lavery of Emory University, because we, we want to even challenge our own yeah. ideas around acceptance. But, but just on the consent thing, uh, so um, there's two aspects to this. So for general releases within a neighborhood, we do not use individual consent. And the reason for that is the intervention is not delivered to individuals. The risk posed to humans is minimal. There's an impractic, impractic, uh, impracticability around getting consent, not just be, you, you can get the signs, but you can get the signatures, but then when someone doesn't signature, you, there's just an impracticability about the nature of our intervention, which is more in the environment rather than the individual. Uh, and then actually what we really do have is we have the PAM and the PAM is our focus for assuring the protection of community rights and interests. So in terms of general releases, we, we don't look for individual consent. We are looking for this community acceptance, which I've mentioned. Now, of course, we do actually, as part of our releases, we will have uh, we will have uh, mosquito release containers. N neighbors and community volunteers agree to take on one of those. And for those things, it's on their property. Of course, we have individual consent for that and individual consent for monitoring that might take place on their, on their property. Um, so that's just kind of the, the some of the mechanics of it. On, on a higher level, I, I think, the, and this kind of connects with the concept of borrowing trust, there's, there's sort of an equation, it's, it's kind of an equation I've been kind of thinking about, which is kind of status. So if, if we think of status that an organization like WMP or, or any other organization has, status could be connected with our reputation, our competence, and also a delegated authority we have from a... Um, from uh, a government or yeah. you know from a, a municipality so if we think of status you know status is is just you know in WMP we believe status is not enough it's not enough that we've got a good reputation it's not enough that we've got delegated authority it's not enough that we've got um, competence we also have to establish standing and standing is earned through our behaviors in the community and so when we think of the public acceptance model it is really it's it's a model for due diligence yeah. you know it puts us in the place where we say to ourselves have we done enough here mm -hmm. to establish standing? But also actually we ask the community, have we done enough for you? And this then leads me on to acceptance and awareness. There was a question about how we do those. Well, we do a baseline survey which has got around 23 questions where we establish people's level of awareness, awareness of us as an organization, awareness of our communication campaigns, awareness of the Wolbachia method. We also then ask about acceptance. What is your acceptance? Well, as part of the survey, we very much explain it so yeah. that they're making an informed choice. But um, we do that in the baseline. Now, the baseline is not, the baseline is just to see 
where we are before we begin our campaigns, engagement and communication campaigns. But then we do it uh, before we do ever, any releases as well. So we go back and we ask them because of course we're aware that at the baseline we've told them what the method is but they've given us a response a few seconds later well you know that's that's not good enough <laughs> you know we couldn't use that for for saying we've acceptance you know we have to do the whole campaign so that people have lived with these ideas and talked to us and raised queries and gone back mm. and talked to their family so then at the pre-release stage and this would be typically after six nine months maybe um we do that survey as well, so that's how we how we uh, measure the acceptance. I, I think that the the idea that for me is coming to the fore is this this due diligence. You know, I don't think you can have a specific standard that says, "Oh, do A, B, and C, and you're fine." You, you've either got community acceptance or yeah. not got community acceptance. I think there's a range of techniques, and we have to show we've done enough. So I'll, I'll pause there. So That's a very speak. robust answer from both of you. And I love the fact we've got both di two different perspectives. <clears throat> that. Um, this due diligence uh, question and, and the fact that you're, it's almost a self-critical cycle. You're going through evolution yourselves. The dynamic nature of it is very, uh, it's very, very encouraging in that way in terms of if we're talking about empowering communities. So you're, you're on that in, in, in that sense. That's brilliant. Flipping that to Elodie, um, obviously, we're talking about consent, but we could talk about how your because you, you you flashed up a, a big list there, amazingly long list there in terms of uh, the credits of the film as well as your slides of your stakeholders, government, all of it. Um, that community of practice or community, as it were, how did that impact the patient consent that you would have seen and you documented, and how would that then accept? Uh, do you think lead on? to acceptance of the single dose tofanaquine uh, and the point of care uh, G6 PD test being up, taken up. Sure. Over, over to you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. And of course, for the for the uh, video, of course, all the patients, you know, we asked for consent, you know, before, of course, um, during the, the, the movie. So that's, uh, of course, um, um, that, that was the, the key. Um, but for in order to measure the adherence, we actually did uh, within that trust study, we did a nested uh, nested study called Quality Trust, cool. uh, which was really a qualitative um, assessment, uh, both on the patient uh, to get patient perspective, but also a healthcare perspective in terms of how these new drugs, single dose, was perceived, but also you know this additional burden of uh, adding one new um, G6 PD yeah. test into the health system. And how was it perceived by both the patient and the healthcare providers? And actually, we, I mean, so it was quite, um, we, we did lots of uh, in depth interview as well as focus group. Um, so uh, about, uh, you know, 300 uh, people altogether were part of this uh, quality trust um, study. And the results were, were very interesting, actually. I mean, both from um, a patient and healthcare perspective. On the patient side, I mean, um, some of the feedback was really that the single dose, uh, of course, improved the adherence to the treatment and also avoid, uh, you know, self-medication later on, you know, within a family. Because with Primaquin, usually what happened is that they would start the treatment for three days and then once they start feeling better, they would just stop taking that uh, and keeping that somewhere, you know, for the next uh, time they, somebody in the family will get sick. So, and that was really seen as a huge improvement for them. Uh, we also got uh, quite some positive feedback, uh, for example, on the packaging of the drug. You know, the fact that the way that the, the drug was packed, was, um, yeah. the way that the packaging was done uh, really actually enabled trust. <laughs> Just to go yeah. back to that word again and again and again, but really important uh, aspects to also consider. And from a healthcare perspective, um, it was also really interesting to get that feedback um, that we then implemented, you know, in the second stage of the study, because the study was done in different stages. For example, in terms of how to improve um, the the, um, the materials that were developed and that were used, um, how to improve the training materials, especially. So we started doing much more videos, for example, um, on how to use the G6V test. We improved the way that the training was done. We um uh, yeah we we changed you know yeah. some 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 the costs that were used for example to track patients and stuff like that so the feedback was uh, really interesting to improve also the way that the study was conducted that's a fantastic answer thank you for that um i think 
Miriam Kashin Rose asked really, but I'm not. I'm, I'm just going to skip, not skip that. I'll ask that, but I'll come back to you. It's going to involve Gilles as well for a second, and come back to you on this and give you some kind of think about it. She's raised the spectre of the uh, pediatric formulation, any liquid formulation given to children, a whole new type of consent or compliance, or the whole kind of trust issue as well in that. And then um, what dose? Uh, this is quite a straightforward question. And dose in terms of the tal talfetaquin was. What, what dose was given. I think you alluded to that in your presentation, but the other two questions yeah. from Mariam, and we'll come back to that on that in a second. Just to bring Gilles in for a second. We've heard uh, a sorry, Cameron, just, to, just to, to jump in very quickly, because I will have to, and unfortunately, I will have to drop of in course, five minutes because I have another call. So maybe if you allow me, I will answer to that specific yeah. question about pediatric tafenoquine, because indeed, together with GXK, we have developed a child-friendly a pediatric formulation. Um, yes. So it's a dispersible formulation, um, which can be um, dissolved in water, very practical to use. It's a 15 milligram dispersible formulation. So the um, those for adults, Tafenoquin is 300 milligram. Uh, those, those for kids is 50 milligram dispersible formulation. And uh, then this is uh, given according to weight of the patients. Um, that so uh, we, we did a, another study called Teach. Um, the result we have published on that, and um, last year we actually got the Australian TG approval uh, for that uh, pediatric formulation, and that was then submitted to a number of different health um, authorities, um, mm -hmm. especially in Brazil. So it's currently under review in Brazil, but also in Peru and Colombia. And so I um, very much agree with that comment that of course it is critical to make sure that. Um, Children also have access to um, those uh, <clears throat> new form, new new product. And in countries like Peru, for example, uh, about sixty percent of the cases are kids. You know, are among right. children. So it is extremely important to make sure that they can um, be treated as well. And in parallel, just to add, uh, and then <laughs> I will have to leave. Sorry, sorry for that. But we are also developing in, in parallel a pediatric formulation for Primaquin, yeah. which is um, you know the other uh, current uh, treatment being used. So in a 2.5 and 5 milligram dispersible formulation as well, um, which is currently under development and should be submitted to WHO um, for their uh, quality review through the pre-qualification team um, next year. So this is also ongoing. So hopefully we should have soon, um, you know, a number of different formulations suitable for, for children. Fantastic. Thank you very, very much for that, Elodie. And we appreciate the, the, the answer that you have to go shortly as well. So thank you for thank that. Thank you so much. Thank you. No, no, thank you very much. And I think that's going to open a lot of new questions. I wish we had more time because packaging for children, the whole con this quality trust uh, nested trial that you mentioned, impacting that onto the design of the further trials, all of it, um, different slant with a pediatric lens. So I'm sure hopefully in the future we'll have a chance to have a connect session to open that up. Um, and then see the actual impact as well, post-April, fingers crossed for your April, as, as well as you said, I think that's been brilliant. Um, so thank you for that. I wanted to move to Gilles for a second because both Bruno, Alan, uh, well, Bruno, Alan and um, Elodie, you've talked really in, in, in some sense about, well, in a big sense about community empowerment, engagement, moving, you know, that kind of putting them at the heart of stuff. What I wanted to do was ask Gilles something about the F word, the funding word, simply because um, we had a we put in the audience of Patrick Wilson, who um, hasn't asked a question. Patrick, you can ask a question if you want, but I've seen the, I just picked up on the uh, chat, in the chat box, it's from the National Institute of Health Research here in the UK, a major funder in terms of ELMIC countries funding research, operational research in those settings. And they're interested in looking at film for skin um, conditions, Brulee Elsa, probably one of them. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I'd flagged that. <laughs> um, that's a kind of funder, but Gilles, what I wanted to ask you, uh, I think Gilles, you, you're in and out, so perhaps I won't ask that, but I, hopefully you're gonna be there. I think Gilles just dropped out there. Um, if Gilles doesn't come back, we, we, if he comes up, we'll ask him. If not, what I wanted to ask is the funding for this empowerment of communities. We've talked about perhaps short form, uh, user generated content, the putting the community first. Patrick saying thanks, happy to speak, but also to listen. So that's great. But thank you. Um, all of these are kind of skill sets, right? Translating expertise listening to communities, putting that, but giving the community the power to make something, uh, a communication or, 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 you know, be involved. The funding for that, who should pick up the tab for that? 
And I'm going to ask that to WMP first. Oh, yeah. Elodie, thank you. Yeah, I know you have to go. So I'm going to, but I'm definitely going to ask Bruno and I'm definitely going to ask, you know, training these people, mentoring these people is going to have a cost to it. And you want to further energize, further involve these communities. There's going to be a cost. Who should pay for that cost? Either of you. Well, uh, listen again. Um, I was actually mentioning uh, our Catalyst uh, learning learning platform. Um, uh, you know, I mean, from um, the beginning, um, you know, it has been an intention from Scott uh, O'Neill, uh, Professor Scott O'Neill, to really invest in actually a learning knowledge platform. Um, and again, uh, I was mentioning before in my part of the presentation, I've worked in much bigger organization than WMP. But the platform that WMP is currently managing and improving on a daily basis uh, with a very strong team of uh, learning designers and, uh, uh, you know, um, project managers and uh, people who are actually doing to review uh, learning modules and, and so on. And we built actually internal communities also within WMP. So, uh, you know, we will uh, reflect on the, how we can actually improve things, how we can improve storytelling. Uh, Alan is engaging with the community from all with engagement perspective. So what we start to do is to have a dialogue, but the platform itself, uh, it's a big investment, but an investment that we believe it's really worth it uh, to actually train our staff and ultimately also to train communities. Uh, I think the, 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 the goal for WMP is to have actually this platform literally offered to our future yeah. partners when we will implement actually Wolbacca and to say to government, uh, local agency, local mm -hmm. partners, you have actually a full access to Catalyst. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you will be able actually to train uh, your staff to uh, advocate to communities for even actually communities to be able to get actually access yeah. to some learning modules. And Jill was mentioning the fact that uh, it's not too much about actually even reflecting on stories from community, but allowing communities to tell their own stories and their own stories yeah it's actually another another uh, another level but again we invest a lot of money on actually learning knowledge and learning sharing uh you know um and so uh you know it seems to be for us almost like a, a very natural uh, way to actually uh, deliver good communication and good community engagement yeah. simply because the investment is done at the level of WMP from the beginning. Oh, that's a fantastic answer. I mean, you're already getting, you've got a question from Dr. Jeremiah uh, Olatukunbo from uh, Nigeria. He's asking WMP specifically, is there an internship? Are there internship uh, opportunities here in Nigeria for young professionals like myself? So I hope, I, I'm, I can't answer that, but I'm sure, you know, that based on what you just said, that your vision is also going in that direction is catalyst that, that you've mentioned yeah absolutely i think uh, you know the, the fact that we are based in france at the moment for uh, you know allowing actually to have a very smooth and actually have a work-life balance that is absolutely necessary for all of us by communicating with our colleagues in Australia, in Asia, in Latin America. Being yeah. in Europe is actually allowing to do that. But ultimately, one of the main goals for WMP in the next couple of years is how we can actually engage with some pilots in Africa. Uh, and it's probably too early for me to, to name yeah. come countries who may be interested to actually pilot some uh, um, uh, some of the uh, World Bank intervention. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, it's going to happen. And this group mm -hmm. and the organization, Cara, will be one of the first to be uh, informed when we are ready to communicate. Well, that would be fantastic. We'd be honoured. So I remember, really uh, I, it's too early for me to report regarding Nigeria. But uh, definitely, I mean, we are here to make it actually happen. Yeah. As Scott mentioned very often, we won't be with the World Mosquito Programme if we're not working in Africa. Oh, that's brilliant. And that's a very welcome news. That's very welcome news. You're seeing dengue outbreaks in Sudan. We've seen them all over. Uh, you know, the, this issue of differential diagnosis, there is definitely an issue uh, there, but it's kind of underreported. It's an issue and it needs to be tackled at some level. So I think things are catching up to that. And that's really good to hear that. 
Um, we are at five past 11. Honestly, we could go on for another hour. I genuinely mean that because, Gilles, you're coming in and out there, phasing in and out there, uh, materializing, yeah. dematerializing there. And I was going to... <laughs> I was going to ask the funding question because Patrick Wilson from the National Institute of Health Research, who's mentioned that uh, one of their teams, as we have a session later with a film about scabies called Agony of the Night uh, with Dr. Uh, Wanda uh, and an Ethiopian film director, uh, Jerusalem Kasahan, looking at scabies from a community perspective there. And, you know, I wanted to ask really about uh, who should pick up the tab for these mentorship programs for these empowerment of the community it's going to cost so we were going to ask you that i can I, we, we can perhaps discuss a, a subsequent session because we are at six minutes past 11 i'm going to get in a lot of trouble the next session is going to start and, and i'm just cutting alan off there so you have to forgive me because i'm we're going to start at 11 15 and for the next session so with your permission it, is it okay if we just quickly say goodbye and then hopefully yeah hope you yeah and, uh, and then, uh, Karam, as we mentioned in the talk uh, both alan and i we will be able to answer any question uh, during actually the course of a couple of days during the event but also after the event so Karam, you please please communicate our email our contact you can easily find alan or myself on social media to be able to engage or have no hesitation uh, i'm actually also the creator of actually our contact email from the website so if you send an email to our website oh, program.org i will be the one to curate oh. so i will be able to actually answer your question or yeah. ask your question mm. to alan or others yeah. in order to provide you with a very accurate uh, answer brilliant but thank you thank, thank you thank you, thank you, thank you to very, all very much yeah. Bruno, yeah. thank you for that alan thank you for that wonderful presentation thank you very much Gilles, as well um we'll talk again and we'll look at the future in terms of another continuation of this for the next session um we are looking at creative process advocacy from an advocacy perspective chikungunya uh, dengue using ai um and then the dndi's voices for leishman isis um, and then there's a special workshop done by cloud nine media uh, for people looking to translate ideas onto film as well. So that's in the next. We flashed up the um, the relevant link because it's a different link for each session and that email has already been sent out. Um, from me, thank you very, very much. I'm going to have to bid adieu and I hope you can join us uh, for the rest of the two days. Um, genuinely, it's been fantastic. Thank you very, very much. Okay, both all of you. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks a thank lot. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.